This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, I'm back. We're still looking at February. We got all these campaigns. We didn't have much in the way of war games last time, but we got some this time. And uh, RPGs, board games, just all the cards and skirmish and all the other crazy kind of stuff you could be wanting to, uh, to back for your 2020. And uh, yeah, let's get started. First up is GURPS Dungeon Fantasy Book 2, and this is just more of the same creatures, uh, items, that kind of thing, for the generic universal role-playing system. So if you wanted to create your own fantasy world, and you didn't know how to do it, you wanted something that was completely different, and maybe uh, other systems were a little uh, bit of a hindrance for you, this GURPS system is made to be generic so that you can put any world on top of it. This just happens to give you some ideas on some fantasy uh, tropes and uh, other ideas that maybe you can't find in other places. You can take a quick look at it. Steve Jackson Games tends to do these quick uh, Kickstarters because they've got the books ready to go. They're just raising some money to put it uh, in stores or show popularity, whatever the case is. Uh, I was probably a fan of the uh, original GURPS when I was a kid. Pretty big fan because I like the idea of being able to mix and match all the different pieces of all the different things I was interested in and put it into uh, whatever type of game I wanted. Sticking with generic tools, we have the Outdoor Encounter Cards. This is the third version of them by Philip Reed, and it's made to be a generic outdoor encounter. If you didn't know what else to build and you wanted to just randomize it using a card, uh, it's got some flavor text and a little bit of black and white art, then that's what this is for. If you uh, use Nerdarchies out of the box encounters or any of these other types of uh, tools uh, to help randomize your um, DM time so that you don't have to spend as much of it um, sitting there thinking about a perfect encounter. You just want to get a game together until you get the next step in your, uh, you know, in the next step in your adventure or campaign, whatever you've got uh, going on at the time. This will help you out. If you're a new DM and you don't know what else to do, this will help you out. You're a fantasy writer and you don't know what else to put your characters through and you're in the middle of a second act and you don't know what else uh, they could have to deal with before they get to the final uh, you know, uh, conflict. Here, get something like this. That can help you out too. Then we have Astrahis. This is the Wave 3 version. Uh, it's Egyptian themed. It's a skirmish game. And I've been looking for a while for something that was different than zombies or vampires. And I thought maybe there'd be a good idea to have some mummies uh, to fight against. And that's what this game is basically providing is the opportunity to fight against things that you would see in ancient Egypt. Uh, I doubt they had the Smilodons that they're jumping on top of or winged people back in ancient Egypt. But that's nice to have as well, just to throw some influence from the gods and other things that are in there. Uh, I say that because I believe Smilodons were a North American uh, animal as opposed to uh, something that you would have found in Africa. But hey, that's what fantasy is for. Maybe that's where this guy's from. He just came over the land bridge a different way. Who's to say? But uh, yeah, it's just something different to play through. And uh, it's out there. It's available. And if you're looking for something different for a skirmish game or you just want to use the minis for a, a different skirmish game you already own, that's what Astralis is for. And then we have a returning setting. This is Sky Archipelago Episode 2. They are creating 24 to 36 page episodes, and then eventually they'll have a full campaign setting. You can pick up the first one as well. This is for any system. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just an RPG world that you can play through. Um, I will say that they have this Wanderer's Legacy, which is an interesting add-on, and it's kind of neat. However, the aging uh, that they put onto the paper is about the same as what it is in um, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective in some of the, the books, and it makes it hard to read. Uh, I know that a lot of people will really enjoy the way that it gives it that aged look, the, the brown that they put on top and the yellows and all that. I just wish people would tone it down in the center of the page and use it more along the edges of the page, just make it look burned or whatever. Because when you got to read a lot of text, then it makes it really difficult to see because it's not as much contrast against the page. That's just my gripe on that. However, if you're looking for a way to take your uh, wandering party into the sky and uh, have them go around different floating islands and see an entirely different world, an entire, different, entirely different setting, then uh, give Sky Archipelago a shot. And even more customization. we got a lot coming up right here at the beginning of February. 
into the abyss. These are beautiful uh, sculptures. They're amazing. Different warriors, but you can put it into any game. They're uh, not part of a particular system. You can take it into Warhammer. You can take it into RPGs. You can just paint the things because they look awesome. They'd fit with, uh, if you have Hate, the Adrian Smith game. Um, these are like upgraded versions of those guys. There's a lot of different worlds it could fit in. I don't think it would fit into Kingdom Death, but just about anything else uh, that has a little bit of fantasy. These could just be uh, gore, right? If uh, you wanted to have in some way a battle of the bands and you wanted uh, a bunch of dudes that look like guys from war, this guy, you know, these guys would fit into that as well, or Lord Eye or whatever metal thing you're into. All kinds of uh, options are available. They look really cool. The one guy sitting there standing on top of a dragon's head. You get the bannerman in the back, crazy metal axes. They look cool. There are so many more you can see on the right that the, it's a big listing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think if nothing else, you should just take a quick look at it and see if it inspires you to uh, create a new barbarian or fighter or anything else. Then we have Sandy Peterson coming back for Glorantha, and uh, he is the best at creating games that don't have, um, like every faction is not necessarily the same, but they're definitely balanced. So uh, lots of different strategies, different ways to win, and he's done Cthulhu Wars, he's done all these different other types of games that have basically the same feel to it. This one just happens to be skinned with various gods from various cultures and uh, that's how you fight through you can play up to eight players obviously you need another player because that's just the way that this thing goes it's not necessarily a solo mode and there's new expansions and uh, you can pick up the original game that uh, might have been hard to find from before and if you were a fan of something like Thulu Wars I would suggest jumping on on this again if especially if you're a fan of other mythologies then we have a war game without all the pretty minis. This is This War Without an Enemy. And it has um, an interesting setting in that it's in the first English Civil War. Long time ago. <laughs> and uh, everything's done with blocks. And map looks pretty cool if you're uh, an Anglophile uh, and you're a uh, war gamer. You're tired of World War One or whatever the case is. You just want something um, where the strategy would be different because it wouldn't be necessarily using um you know definitely not cannons uh, more like pikes uh, maybe they'd have some bowmen i don't know if the english longbow was uh put into use uh, at that time uh the terrain would be quite different because of uh if you've been playing in africa or asia or other bigger parts of europe then it's more contained uh with uh, just what's on the island for england so yeah very different and uh, I haven't seen this setting pop up anywhere. The board looks great, as you can see there in the inset. In the bottom right, they've uh, done a good job with the uh, filigree. And uh, just the whole, uh, the feel of the board fits the, uh, the time frame and everything, even though it is the blocks instead of minis, which is fine too. Then we have from Queen Games, two spring releases. Zen Garden, where you have to make walking paths using various tiles, and you lay them out uh, in a... Japanese style garden or way to go where you're blindfolded and you're given a pen and the other members of your team have to help guide you through a maze while you're blindfolded telling you where to go and, and how much to do. Interesting, they, they're very different uh, types of games. Way to go, haven't seen anything like that but with like Nyctophobia and other games uh, that have come out with blindfolds maybe this is an easier uh, version of that you can play with any age or any ability. Um, and, you know, just have your whiteboard ready to go and, uh, and draw another map if you decide to change it up. Uh, in Zen Garden, it's probably going to be very Zen, very relaxing to go through and just, uh, non-competitively think about, uh, how best to construct, um, this garden with all the different things in it. I mean, you just sit there and, uh, think back and what it would be like to sit in the, uh, the park, or maybe you could be in a park. Or a Japanese garden that's local to your town, and uh, and play through this game. So seems relaxing. Queen Games, they've always got something on here. A little less zen, but just as cooperative. We have Flap Flap Duck, and in this game, 
you were trying to guide a duck with a concussion through a series of obstacles using clue cards and directions and commands that you have in your hand. So each player would take a turn and you would try to figure out how best to navigate this concussed duck through the board. As far as theme goes, yeah, that is crazy. Uh, as far as fun, I'm not sure. You're going to have to look in it, at it and see if uh, it would be uh, something that you could all just sit there and cooperate on and have a neat time. I think at least uh, one or two times it might be fun, um, but you know, it just depends on the level of challenge and how many boards are available and how random it feels that you get those uh, directions uh, and you know how much of a puzzle the whole thing is. But uh, yeah, it just seems like an interesting way to uh, or theme to present having a uh, I can cuss the duck as the protagonist. Then if you would prefer to have a JRPG aesthetic in your games instead of the minis that you already have, that's what Myth Explorers 4 is all about. They have lots of different uh, types and versions. They're all 32 millimeters, so they should be able to sub in. But they're basically made to be as generic as possible. So if you wanted to have something that looked like a JRPG or one of those uh, Korean MMOs, then uh, they've got you covered. And there's a cat. People like cats. Figure to throw that in there, let you know. You can jump in and get that as well. They're all resin, so be aware resin is incredibly brittle. And these are not STL files for you to print yourself. This is stuff that they're going to send you. But there is a wide selection, and you can uh, sub in lots of cool stuff and customize it. It's your game. Do whatever you want to do. See if. Uh, one of their previous sets maybe has something that uh, you would be interested in or maybe you just want to paint that's an option for you as well and that's perfectly okay then we have a neat little card game for the modern times this is filthy kings i don't know if the name fits or is going to tell you exactly what the game is about but maybe the the kings i think maybe the card game where you have to bluff and you say you have uh, whatever you're putting down on a face down pile and if they don't uh, believe you, then you have to take it all back in your hand. I've played some Filipino versions of that type of game, uh, but maybe that's what this is about. I think they should change it, <laughs> the title, uh, to be a little more successful. But otherwise, the art looks neat, and it's talking about people like that uh, talk on their phones too loud, or they eat smelly food in public, or whatever the, the case is. And uh, I think a lot of people will learn some manners and a little bit of courtesy by having whatever it is that they do included in the game. So maybe this is a subtle way to passive aggressively tell your uh, friends and neighbors, whoever comes over, you're annoying, right? It gives you that uh, that, that icebreaker to be like, you do that. Um, hopefully this won't cause too many fights though, but uh, it does seem fun, it does seem funny and uh, interesting if uh, this is the game for you. Three to five players though, so keep that in mind, but at least it plays quick. Then we have a RPG adventure. This is a hidden hand of the Horla, and this is about a tower that reappears. It's an ancient tower that used to be a rumor, and all of a sudden it pops in, and now you get to run through it. So that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> if you play old school RPGs, uh, I believe it's set up for the Osric system, then uh, this could be useful for you. If you did pick it up though and you just wanted something to use even in 5e, I know it's not already set up for it, but you could probably find uh, comparative tables and stat blocks and all that to use and otherwise you could just use the adventure. Uh, the idea is um, uh, mix and match with a few things to spice up your own adventures. If you weren't otherwise engaged in a campaign maybe this will give you some good ideas or you could just introduce your group into the old way of doing things why not mix it up a little bit show them what it was like then we have a card-based competitive rpg from the people that made unstable unicorns so the artwork is done in a very cutesy style but the action is supposed to be brutal and that irony between the two th things is supposed to be what sells it I don't think the name Here to Slay is very good for a box on the shelf. Like once it goes to Target or uh, some other big box retailer, Unstable Unicorns told you right away what was going on and how the card uh, art style fit with everything. Uh, this one, I'm not sure 
how the here to slay thing works. I don't know. Maybe that's like an urban dictionary thing. I'm not not, not uh, familiar with on how that goes together. It's entirely possible. Uh, but I just I I wonder uh, if the name perhaps will keep people from jumping in on it if uh, they just see the the outlines of characters and whatnot uh, on the box art and all that. Otherwise, the game I'm sure might be a lot of fun. Uh, Unstable Unicorns did a ton of business and is everywhere it's available everywhere so these guys have already blown past any expectation they could have possibly had for the kickstarter and i'm sure it's going to make it to retail there's a lot of exclusives also offered in this campaign so if you didn't want to wait for retail and you wanted some uh, incentives then they've got a lot there for it then we have a sci-fi skirmish game don't let the jungle setting fool you this is all about being an army in space from whatever types of aliens versus each other it has 20 unique factions for two to six players uh there are you can play probably with whatever you want but that's just the scenarios they're including for two to six uh sci-fi is pretty awesome if you were a fan of all of the crazy stuff like warhammer that's already out there the 40k versions and all that then uh, maybe you're looking for more and star breach might be able to help you you might also be able to use these minis as your own type of kill team or whatever and just sub them out if that's your decision. Then we have urban dice. What makes them urban? Well, the highest values have been changed up to uh, some of them are buildings, some of them look mechanical. So if you were looking for something that doesn't necessarily fit a fantasy theme that a lot of the other dice uh, are using, then perhaps these urban dice will be for you. Um, I don't know that any of them are specific to anything, but if you were to play Star Breach, if you were to play Starfinder, if you were to play uh, any of these other uh, space-based games and you were looking for something particularly themed for your character or maybe even just the differences in the color schemes, they do pop pretty well, um, except the green to the black. That one, you know, just because they're darker colors, uh, might make it a little bit difficult to see in the, not the brightest of light settings. But uh, for the most part, I think they'll work pretty well. Uh, lots of different variety. And it's good to have a custom version uh, for whatever game that you're playing at the time. Just to make the whole experience feel thematic. Then we have Jurassic Parts, which I have to give them credit for on their video. They found someone who sounded like Rich and At Richard Attenborough from Jurassic Park. That was a nice little touch. This game is about using chisels on a tile system, and eventually the fossil piece will break away, and you're going to get points based on the number of chisels that you used. So in a way, you're being cooperative in that you're trying to get a big chunk of a particular fossil piece. But in another way, at the same time, you're being competitive in that you're trying to make sure that you get as much of the dinosaur as possible uh, with as many chisels of your side as possible. So, yeah, are you going to be uh, focusing on like a small chunk in the beginning to break off, or are you going to try to make uh, all your moves to make a big chunk at the end? So there's a lot of different strategies uh, that could happen in here. It seems pretty neat. And after having a pretty light wargaming month in January, we've got a whole lot coming out this week with DVG Warfighter Battle Packs number two, and they have all different kinds of stuff. So it, even though it says just uh, Battle Packs 2, there is some new things, but it looks like they're offering even the older stuff. Um, if you want uh, different variations of military strategy built into a card game, I don't think that this one plays uh, like the other war games do with a map. I think it's mainly just done from the cards. Uh, but they try to be as realistic as possible, and they have every kind you can imagine, various different countries and time frames. So... Take a look at what they're looking for, or what they have on offer if you're looking for expansions, uh, or if there's a theater campaign that you have yet to uh, introduce into your gaming group, then uh, DVG might have you uh, sorted out. Then we have a long-awaited expansion, Doom on the Warden for Metamorphosis Alpha, and Metamorphosis Alpha is the first sci-fi RPG. So... The idea being, this is the Tomb of Horrors for sci-fi RPGs. 
written by the guys that originally worked with Gary Gygax at TSR. This has all the credibility that you could be looking for. Um, James M. Ward is the one behind all of this. So if you're interested in the oldest of the old school uh, way of doing things, I definitely recommend you taking a look at this. Uh, if you've never heard of the original RPG uh, for Metamorphosis Alpha, then give it a shot. I mean, they were trying a lot of crazy things back then. And yeah, maybe it's a lot more streamlined now, but maybe you don't want everything streamlined. Maybe you want things to be dangerous. Maybe you want things to be exciting. And uh, definitely if you have Pathfinder and things are a little too sanitized, you might need your own Tomb of Horrors. But if that's too old school for you, that's what Tortuga 2199 can help fix. This is another space game. Uh, it has a little bit of deck building and area control for two to four space pirates. That's what it's all about. Stealing stuff. Tortuga means uh, turtle. I'm not sure how that part fits in. Uh, maybe it's just because of uh, the way that certain pirate ships may have been named or an island. Uh, but um, last time I checked, it meant turtle. So... Whatever your play style is, they've got a bunch of different factions available. And if you always wanted to be a pirate king, but you didn't want to waste your time with sails, then why not a spaceship? Gray Fox Games has you covered. Then we have a game that didn't quite make it, but is back. And looks like they've gotten the, uh, the price down, or at least got enough people interested. And that is Forsaken Forest, The Spirit Uprising. It doesn't look like what it is, which might be hurting it. And that is... A social deduction game. It, it takes place in a dark fantasy world and they say it's supposed to fix a lot of the problems that happen in other social deduction types of games. I hope they do. They spent a ton of time making these animated GIFs. Their website is full of them. Um, and it, it looks cool, right? When you just sit there and stare at it, it, it catches the eye. But you got to look and see if this type of social deduction game is for you. For me, most of the social deduction things I see look boring. If you, as soon as you get knocked out, then uh, what do you do with the rest of your time while well, 10 or 15 of your friends are just still playing the game? You go to the bathroom, you go get some chips. I mean, it, just, it doesn't seem like you're playing the whole time. And that's one of the aspects they're trying to, uh, to deal with in this game is to make it fun all the way through. And then we got another set of tools for you. This is Flextail 2.0, the dynamic adventure generator for any RPG that you want. It is all fantasy-based, uh, so I don't want to say any, but any fantasy-based RPG, you want to uh, make an, just a single encounter. You can randomize the whole world if you wanted to. Um, all the treasures, the maps, the monsters, whatever happens in the quests. You could have even the names of the NPCs you meet up with. Everything can be run through the tables uh, of this generator so that you can just set up a game and be ready to go. If you're not an experienced uh, DM and you don't have a campaign world already set up for yourself, then uh, this is a good way to understand all of the things that you need to put together for a campaign. And you can just let the system create it for you. And then later on, you can start picking and choosing uh, stuff for yourself. Um, that gives more meaning for your group, but otherwise maybe you're just lazy that day. Flextail's there to help you out. And once you set up that world, maybe you need some minis to populate it. 3D tabletop, 3D printable stuff. They're not the highest detail things ever, so that is useful in some worlds. Uh, so you're not uh, having to use two specific uh, one-use items. Instead, then you can use it in multiple worlds. Um, and multiple adventures, and these guys can sub out for various things much more easily if they don't have a lot of detail. But that's up to you, how you're going to paint it, how you're going to put it together, and uh, how many of these things you would like or need. They have dungeons, they have effects, they have monsters, they've got heroes, they've got all kinds of stuff available for a very low price, uh, considering the cost of sculpting and everything. If you've got a resin printer, another thing without having a just a ridiculous amount of detail, you might be able to just print these off on FDM. Uh, something with like a 0.1 uh, layer height. Uh, 0.2 is still probably too big for this, but uh, 0.1 might be just enough to make it work for you. Uh, you don't have to do it in resin necessarily. PLA might be just enough. Uh, I think PLA would be perfect, especially for the scenery. 
And after you spend all the time terraforming Mars, maybe it's time to migrate to it. This is the race to build the first human city, and it is about strategy and revenge. Uh, very uh, light on the detail as far as uh, the plastic bits and bobs that go with it. But like I said, if you're playing terraforming Mars already and you're ready to go through the next step, I think it fits pretty perfectly. As far as where the revenge is, you're going to, uh, to have to find that part in the story. They are using crystals as a resource. I think it's kind of a cop-out, I'll be honest with you. There's so many other things that Mars could have that magic crystals is not going to work for me. But maybe that makes you feel like StarCraft, and uh, that's what you need to get. Maybe there's some, uh, what is it, Vesper gas or anything like that? I don't remember what it was. Vespertine? No, not Vespertine. Whatever it was. The gas, maybe that's there too. I'm not going to say. But uh, yeah, if you need something to uh, to have uh, combat versus uh, astronauts, do it. And then there's a campaign that I read wrong at first. I was like, man, that is way too much money for what that is. And it's because it's in Mexico dollars. It's in pesos. Uh, it goes for about 20 US dollars. I was like, but it's $450. No, 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 no. Read it carefully. It was Mexico dollars. It just uses the same dollar symbol. Uh, and that is RPG Sounds. This is basically a soundboard for you to increase the immersion of your uh, fantasy RPG campaigns. And you even get some bonuses for uh, backing. You get STL files that you can print off your own. That mimic looks awesome. The bard, if you were a bagpipe bard, that would be interesting as well. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of cool ideas and extras that, to go along with it. Relatively easily priced. And uh, being able to have uh, an easy-to-use soundboard. You might not just use it for the RPG sounds. You might slot in whatever uh, other stuff that you want. It just happens to be skinned for more of a uh, fantasy world. But you might be able to pop in some pew pews or whatever if uh, you're going to use it for Starfinder or one of the other star games that uh, have come out or even were included in this episode. And then we have a tool for playing board games with your friends if you don't want to use Tabletop Simulator. And instead you want an expensive articulating arm to put your phone on top of the game so that your other friends can see you play. Um, it looks neat and all that, but here's some problems. It's all battery operated, right? How quickly does your phone lose its charge? So you might not make it through a full three, four hour game. You might have to only play games that can be played within an hour or two because of uh, how much battery draw that's going on. Or you've got all these charge cables going on everywhere. That's another difficult piece. It's probably too expensive for what it is that I can see because there's some uh, various arms that uh, you could just buy off Amazon, uh, camera mounts, that kind of thing, for way cheaper. But if you want this included solution with this app, that's up to you. It's just I'd rather put something together myself if I needed it. And uh, sound would be another issue. Um, if everybody had headphones, then maybe that would make things a little easier. So not talking over each other all the time. Uh, but if you're just one person and then you're playing with one other person, maybe it'll work. Then if you like all of those RPG tools, but you want it in an Adventure Time cartoon style, that's what Slow Quest character cards are about. Um, it seems to be a lot more in-depth than the art style would suggest. Uh, I'm not sure... If this is for everybody, uh, a lot of times you want something to be super cool on the table and you want it to look, um, you had the cards that we had in the beginning that had the black and white, or you want uh, something that is full color instead of this is just like, you know, usually two tone, three tones. Um, but if you want it in this style, Bodhi H has you covered. And if you want it in a different style, we had all different types of campaigns in this episode and many other episodes before uh, to help you out. This is entirely a stylistic choice. Then we have a steampunk choose your own adventure. This is meant to be a full RPG, basically, that uh, takes place in a choose your own adventure style. In what I love the title, The Reeking Metropolis. 
because if you had everything running off of coal, it's going to stink. <laughs> it's going to have uh, acid rain. It's going to have all the, the problems. And uh, I like the idea of it all. This is three books, one adventure. So there's, um, it's, as it sh shows, Steampunk Highwayman 3, you can also get one and two to go along with it. If you're a steampunk motorcyclist running through um, this world, and as you can see, the, the art on the bottom, I, I had a hard time fitting it all. I just thought it would be uh, better if I left it at its original size there. Um, you have all the fights that you would get in, it, like the ones from uh, Sherlock Holmes, the Robert Downey Jr. version, and uh, other options that I hope the story is really good. I have no idea. Uh, obviously, you don't want to have any spoilers, but if the setting is interesting, then maybe you'll give the story a shot. I'm very, very tempted to uh, to play through the whole thing. And if steampunk's not your thing, maybe you want to crawl through a dark forest, and that is the trophy role-playing game. And they're doing a pretty cool thing where they have three different books, uh, two adventures, and then in its own system, a story light, uh, a... I don't know, it's not story light, it's story heavy, but it's rules light, streamlined system. But then there's a third book that will allow you to incorporate the things that you like about Trophy into other RPGs. That's a great deal, because maybe you don't want to learn new rules, but you want to use the world. So that will help you incorporate everything. I think it's a good idea. Uh, Dark Fantasy is very popular. Dark Fantasy is a lot of fun. Because uh, you don't have to think about the monsters. They're just monsters. Go kill them. Have a good time. Be a murder hobo. Have a, have a blast. Um, and maybe the world has terrors and things in the night that you've never thought of before. Take a look at what they're offering. They have a couple of sneak peeks you can check. Uh, you can examine. Uh, the art is neat and thematic without giving too much away. So, yeah. Take a look at Trophy. Then if you want a card game version of Russian Roulette, that is Psycho Chickens. That's basically this game. You play everything face down so you don't know what you're going to pop out with next. And uh, you try to avoid the bullet that is the Psycho Chicken. That's it. It's cute. It can play really fast. Or depending on who's in the group and how much uh, anxiety they have about the situation, it could play pretty slow. But there are interesting, fun versions of uh, the various cards, things that you can pop up with. There's a lot of humor involved. Take a quick look and see if this is something that uh, you think would be fun at your table. Um, if you're a fan of exploding chickens, then maybe Psycho, or sorry, exploding kittens, then maybe Psycho Chickens uh, will also be fun for your group, especially if they're uh, not control freaks and they're okay with uh, things being random because you can't see what's happening. That wraps it up. Other Kickstarter news. Uh, Nemesis from Awaken Realms. They just announced that they're going to have a two-sided playmat. A lot of people have been asking for. The first time I took the thing out, I was like, oh man, I wish this was a playmat. So they're making one. I did see somebody else with almost the exact same mat artwork. And they were offering it for $80. I'm going to guess that's going to be the price. Who knows what the bulk price will be. Maybe it'll be a little bit lower, but it ain't going to be cheap. But it might be worth it. It's going to be double-sided to have both boards from Af Aftermath and from Nemesis on it. So think about that. Um, other than that, i got a bunch of other stuff coming in. And while I'm continuing to uh, be part of the last group to get Street Masters Aftershock, I'm going to do a video that was requested uh, sometime this weekend to uh, do a full playthrough. I'm going to not animate this one. All of my other ones have been animated and they take like a week to 10 days to do all the stuff for it. And I'm tired <laughs> by the end of it because I can't get any sleep because I have to spend all my time sitting in a chair animating. And uh, this time I'm just going to do uh, a live one and we'll see uh, how well that goes. It'll be the last one in the series, I believe, for this channel just because I'm going to migrate all of the live playthroughs and other information about Street Masters to a separate channel that you can subscribe to um, if you're interested in that. Otherwise, I'm going to continue to keep the Kickstarter coverage and all that for everybody on this channel. I just want to separate it out in case you're not interested in Street Masters, and I don't want people to get confused with the changes from Aftershock versus what's available um, I don't want to get them to think that they were missing out on something or they have the wrong version uh, if they bought it retail or, you know, whatever. 
um, because there were some, some errata that are from the first version, Rise of the Kingdom, that were all fixed and uh, taken care of when you could buy it at the store. Just trying to make things work for everybody. You guys have a good one. I'm going to go uh, walk around my room a little bit and watch YouTube videos because uh, that's where all the fun's at, right? That's why you guys are here. Have a good one.